Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be with all of you once more. It's a good day, amen? We're alive, we're healthy. So it's a blessed day. And I uh, thank the Lord for that. I thank uh, Brother Neil. Uh, he said uh, Pastor Henry Sawaski is going to preach here, so I think I can walk off. Amen. <laughs> but yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It does happen. And, uh, you know, it's good to serve the Lord. It's good to serve the Lord. And uh, we're praying as well that God would send you the right man uh, or church uh, for City Baptist in London, where we're at. I've been preaching there quite a bit lately because we didn't have a pastor either, but now a pastor has been voted in as interim pastor. So we do have an interim pastor now, and that's a blessing. So uh, I won't be preaching quite as much, I guess, or maybe in different places then. Uh, God has been good. I've been in Simcoe and Woodstock and, and different places. So, And now Pastor Neil invited me here. And it's always a blessing to preach the Word of God. You know, uh, Pastor uh, Brother Neil was... Uh, praying for the missionaries. And, and I just want to mention that a little bit as well, you know, how important it is we do pray for them. We do not know their needs, but we don't know their tr trials either. It's difficult out there in the mission field. Uh, to start a church is not easy. So uh, just keep on praying for them. It's a blessing to hear that churches are still supporting missionaries. But I want to go to the book of Acts this morning. In the book of Acts, and uh, I want to go to chapter 2, but also chapter 4. And uh, I want to read in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And then I'm going to go to, we're going to jump to chapter 4, verses 31 through 33. Acts chapter 2 says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather here in your holy name, uh, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the salvation you've given us through your sh only begotten Son, shed blood, Lord, Heavenly Father. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be with us this morning. Lord, that you would take away all obstacles that want us to Think about something else while we're here. Lord, open our minds, give us understanding, and speak to us in a special way this morning. And I pray that you would put words in my mouth that you want us to hear this day. I'm giving myself into your holy hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the Word of God has so much to say. And, and uh, you know, being a pastor in a church, it's a little bit different. I usually preach through a whole book. I start in verse 1 and I finish the book, let's say Romans or Acts. It's compository preaching and I love doing that. There's so much in there Then at least you know if you don't get it done that Sunday, you can go next Sunday again. Amen? And if you preach this way, well, you need to prepare a message and try to get everything in uh, at a time. And uh, here we see in chapter 2, 
Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. What I want to look at today, and I title it this way, The Characteristics of a Spirit-Filled Church. I believe we need an awakening today in the churches. I believe we need a revival. I believe that us as Christians, we need to be awakened of the need that there's out there. People need to be saved. Christ has not come back yet. He will. He might come back today. Amen? But he's still not come back. So what does that mean? There's still some people that need to be saved. Amen? And how is the church today? When we, go, when we go to Revelation and we look at the book of Revelation, God is speaking to different churches. But one thing God says there, he'd rather the church be cold or hot, but not lukewarm. And I think a lot of churches have fallen into almost lukewarm. We want to have one foot in the world, and we want to have one foot in heaven. And it doesn't work that way. God wants us to be cold or hot, and he'd rather we be hot. And what does that mean? We'd be working for him as a church. We'd be working for him as a church. And I want to look at that today a little bit, and at the first church here in Acts. This was the first church in the Bible. Amen? So I want to look at this. You know, uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 31 again, in chapter 4, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now here, in chapter 2, that's where the rushing mighty wind came in. And then after that, Peter preached, and in verse 41 of chapter 2, 3,000 souls were saved in one day. We see the power of God when a church is united. We see the power of God. So people were saved. And here in chapter 4, these people were saved. But we see one thing here. They congregated frequently. They did everything together. They were of one mind, of one accord. They agreed with each other that, of what to do. And I believe God still wants that. I want to look today, I want to see if we can see a glimpse of God's plan and purpose for the New Testament church. But I also want us to see how the power of the Holy Spirit is required to achieve that purpose. The power of the Holy Spirit is required to achieve that purpose. But I also want us to understand that the church is composed of individual Christians and can be no stronger than its members. This church can be no stronger than its members. Any other church can be no stronger than its members. So let's e ask each other, us who, we who are members of a New Testament church. Because I believe this is a New Testament church. Amen? I believe that. I've been here enough to know the Word of God is being preached. This church is jealous for the Word of God. They love the Word of God. And I love that about this church. But I don't know why God gave me this message. I guess he wants this church maybe to be united even a little bit more. Now, could this church be united a little bit more than what it is? I believe every church could be united more than it is. We could do so many things together as a church. And that's what God wants. And he's given us an example here of his first church. But I also want to challenge us to live as spiritual believers in the church, but also in the community. And this is a challenge to each and every believer. How do people out there see us every day? How do they see us? So yes, I want to challenge us. When Jesus returned to heaven, he left instructions for his disciples to witness beginning in Jerusalem. Let's go to chapter 1, and I'm just going to read it there. We're close. So I'm going to go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says... 
but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is not a request. This is a commandment. Amen? He commands us to be witnesses. He doesn't ask us to. He has saved our souls. Now, how many can say amen to that? Are we saved today? Have we accepted Christ as our personal Savior? And I hope we can all say yes to that and amen to that. But then I ask, have we accepted Jesus as our Lord as well? Yes, if we are saved, he is our personal Savior. But if he's our Lord, then we submit our lives to him 100%. That means he is our boss. We do what he tells us to do every minute of every day. Amen? That is if he's our, our Lord. All we have to do is say, here is my life. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say to the people. But God, you do. You know their needs. You know exactly the words they need to hear. Here's my mouth. Here's my brain. Use it. Have you ever said that to your Lord and Savior? And believe me, if you mean it, you will see wonders happen in this church. And that's what God wants. In just the first few weeks following Pentecost, the church took the city. Historians record that tens of thousands were saved. The church grew rapidly. Is Open Bible Baptist growing rapidly today? Should there be awakening here in this church? And I don't think only in this church. I believe in so many churches. It's sad to hear church after church after church is closing around the country. It shouldn't be like that if people are on fire for Jesus. I remember when I got saved, man, I was on fire for Jesus. I just wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And you know, I, and I probably said that here before, I thought all my friends would just jump right in the boat and go with me. Boy, was there a surprise. But I still told them about what Jesus had done for me. And a lot of them are saved today because of it. Not because I told them, but because Jesus gave them convictions they needed salvation as well. Amen? You know, historians, like I said, recorded tens of thousands were saved. The church grew rapidly. The outstanding characteristics, characteristic of that first church was that it was spirit-filled. And that made the difference. If this church is going to be spirit-filled, that will make all the difference. And when we say spirit-filled, we mean that we are submitted to God's will that the Spirit has control 100% over our thinking, over our actions, everything we think and do as a church. That means we need to come together, agree, have something in common. We work together, we pray together, we do things together. And sadly, in churches today, even though we should work together so many times, and I'm not saying that's going on in this church. Somebody has said something to somebody else, and then there's conflicts. We can't get right with God, even in the church. So how can the church grow if we can't forgive each other? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? If we're saved, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be like this church was. Most of the leaders were not well-educated men, nor were the members uniquely gifted or qualified, but the church demonstrated the power of God from the very beginning. God does not look at how well-educated we are. Amen? He does not look at that. 
although we as people do, but God looks at the heart. Is this person willing to serve me the way I want him to? And then he looks at the church, and he wants the church to come together, and he wants each and every person to be right with him. Are we right with God today? Have we forgiven the person that said something to us that actually is, was bothering us? I love what a preacher said once. That I heard a preacher say, and I, I probably said that here before as well, but I'm not going to be a barn where Satan can pile up all his garbage and anytime he wants to use it to weaken me. I'm going to forgive the next person the moment he offends me. I'm not going to use, let Satan use that for me not to serve. And Satan loves that. If somebody says something about us that offends us, he uses that for us to live in sin. And the next person might not even know that you're offended. So we should forgive. And I believe these people did all things together. Remember, the church is not a building. Amen? If this building should burn down, and I pray to God that it won't, but if it should burn down, people would say, and the news would say, Open Bible Baptist Church burned to the ground. I hope that wouldn't be true. Because the church is we, the people. Amen? All those that are members of Open Bible Baptist Church are the church. It's not the building. This is the building that God has given this church to congregate in, to come and worship him, come and honor and glorify him, lift up his name, and to learn how to walk with him in a better way daily. The word of God is being preached here, but the church is we the people. So yes, the only way a church can be spirit-filled is for its members to be spirit-filled. In Acts 4, we see some characteristics of a church where God's spirit is working in a mighty way. If we are living in the fullness of his power, these things will be true for, of our churches as well. The first mark of the church was unity. Chapter 31. Again, I'll go back there. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. There was unity in a church. They assembled together for prayer. And their prayer was heard and was answered. The place was shaken. Wouldn't you love if this place should shake while you come together and pray? That God's power would be manifested in here? And that's what God wants. God wants the churches to live for him. He wants places to shake. God has not changed. God is still the same God he was back then. He can do the same things he did back then. Nothing has changed. God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And he wants his churches to grow. I'm not talking about numbers necessarily right now, but first of all, spiritually. And if we will grow spiritually, the church will grow in numbers. We see that as well. They did everything together. The place was shaken. And what happened? People got saved. Men and women were speaking in different tongues. What does that mean? They were speaking differently than before because now it was God speaking through them. Now they weren't depending upon their own wisdom, upon what they knew. Now they were depending on, upon what God knew and what God can do and allowed God to work through them. That's the difference. 
When God is in it, there's a big difference. I heard a pastor say, sometimes we as Christians get so busy in the work of God that we forget that God should be in it. We are so busy, we try to do so many things, and we try to do it our way instead of God's way. And then it doesn't produce fruit. God wants to bless his children. God wants to bless the churches. But we need to be united as a church. Every independent church, New Testament church, should be united. And yes, have fellowship with the sister churches in Christ. I believe that's very important. I do. As I go to different churches, I was uh, preaching in, in Semco some, a couple of Sundays back, I guess about three Sundays back. And you know, they, that was first Sunday, them being inside. They had three services that Sunday. Over 100 people to each service. It was a blessing to be there. It was a blessing to be there. But one thing I noticed, and I liked what I saw. When the service was over, nobody hurried to their car and just left. People like to have fellowship. They like to talk to each other. I think that's a good thing. And Mexico, the churches we started there, and the Lord has allowed us to start two churches. The first church we started, it's a, in English it would be a New Peace Baptist Church, and the second one is a Mountain Baptist Church. But the first one, they still do the same thing that we did from the start. Every Sunday, the ladies, they don't call each other, but all the ladies bring in lunch. So they have a buffet every Sunday. Just everybody, whatever they want to take, they have fellowship every Sunday still. And then they take time for prayer after the meal. You know, and that is a blessing to see. God blesses those, those things. We as believers need to have more fellowship than we do. And I know because of COVID, it's been very difficult, all of this. But you know something? We can still have fellowship. Yes? I'm not going to get into that right now, but we should sometimes just invite somebody from church, maybe for lunch, and maybe this church does it all the time. But you know, this first church was united, and that was the first Mark of the church was unity. Repeatedly, Luke tells us that they were with one accord in one place. The members did everything together. They met daily for food and fellowship, we see in Acts 2.46. They thought and learned the doctrines of the word of God, we see in Acts 2.42. The members of the Jerusalem church were from a widely divergent cultures. They were from the same th country. We see in Acts chapter 2, there was people there from every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven. Different cultures. How could a church be so spirit-filled if they were from such different cultures? How was this possible? How could such a varied congregation enjoy such unity? Because I believe, I believe this. I believe they had an overriding interest in the same thing. I believe they had an overriding interest in the same thing. Now my question here today is, and what do we have interest in? Is everybody here interested in Jesus? Is everybody interested in Jesus? They had an overriding interest 
in the same thing, and that was Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus had come to this earth for one reason, and one reason only, is to save sinners. Do we believe this? Can we get around this as a church and just come together and fellowship and pray together and ask for people to be saved in the town of Elmer? Or is everybody in Elmer saved already? I don't think so. And I think in the towns around us, there's a lot of people that need to be saved because at the end of the day, isn't that what life is about? Isn't that to prepare us for eternity? You know, we're walking here today, and all of a sudden we're going to step into eternity. Brother Neil was talking about uh, Brother Abe Friesen's granddaughter, Drew, Drew Newfield. She came out of work, 24 years of age. She didn't make it home. She stepped into eternity. And one day, all of us here will step into eternity. And I thank God for salvation. There is no doubt in my mind that I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. But how many people will not be in heaven because I didn't do what I should have done? What I was commanded to do? To speak to them about Jesus Christ and tell them there is hope. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He paid them in full. If you only repent and believe, God will give you eternal life. How many of us do not take the time to explain to people? Or sometimes we just think, oh, they won't believe anyway. Who are we to know? We are commanded as a church to be a light. Does Almer see a light in this church? Because this is Almer's Open Bible Baptist Jerusalem. Amen? This is where you start. I know it's so easy. Just take the wallet out of the pocket. Oh, we support missionaries. Yes, I'm going to give this and this much for missions. Oh, it's so simple. That way I don't have to pray. That way I don't have to go out there. I don't have to talk to people. Yes, I'm good. No. This is the, your Jerusalem. This is where you start. Amen? This is where the church starts. We start coming together. We have prayer meetings. We have faith. We ask God to give us faith, and we allow God to shake this place so people will see Christ. Like that first church did. It was united. You know, I love sports. Well, I shouldn't say sports because baseball is what I most like. And I'm going to just use it here as an example. I'm not a Blue Jay fan. Don't hold that against me. Okay, I know almost everybody here is a Blue Jay fan. Uh, I'm a Texas Ranger fan. So, But having said that, I'm going to use the Blue Jays as an example here today. Now let's say you and your wife or you one of your children goes to a Blue Jays game. The stadium is packed, 40,000 people. Strangers, you don't know anybody else in the stadium. And the Blue Jays are losing 4-2 to two in the ninth inning. They're coming up, they're losing. And all these, this crowd, 40,000 people are going to be cheering for their team. Why? Because they have an overriding interest in the same thing. They're strangers. They have nothing in common, yet they cheer for the same team. And then the Blue Jays, they walk off with a grand slam and win the game. How everybody's going to be up and high-five each other because they're going to be happy. 
an overriding interest in the same thing. If this can be true for 40,000 strangers in a common baseball game, how much more true should it be for Christians who have an overriding interest in Jesus Christ? If strangers can do this in a common baseball team, and Christians cannot do this in church, something is wrong. Amen? Something is wrong. Have we left our first love? If we're saved, our first love was Christ. Oh man, did we love Jesus because he saved our soul. Oh man, were we broken and thankful that Jesus had lifted us out of the wide road that took us to he was taking us to hell and put us on the narrow road that goes to heaven. Were we thankful? And did we want to tell people about it? What happened? Let's not let the church get lukewarm. We need an awakening. We need to go on our knees and tell God, I am sorry for not having obeyed you. Lord, here I am. Use me for your honor and glory any way you want to. I don't know what to do, but Lord, you do. That's what God wants of his children. He does not just want us to come here and warm up the pews. And I'm glad you're here, because I sure wouldn't like it if I just had to preach the pews. Amen? Because now at least, well, to tell you the truth, now you can't even see a smile anymore on anybody's face. It used to be you could at least see a smile, or you could see a, that means I don't agree, preacher. And that's okay, too. A preacher told me once when I started pre preaching, he said, if you, nobody gets saved after you preach or nobody's mad at you, you didn't preach hard enough. Wow. <laughs> the flesh does not like the truth, does it? We like to be in a comfort zone. Do we not? We love to be in a comfort zone. We don't like the preacher preaching that we should do something as well. You know, the pastor's job is actually here to give all of you spiritual food so you can bring it out there and give it to somebody else. The church wants to put everything on the pastor, and I'm not your pastor. But that's what the church lots of times wants to do. It's the pastor's job to do this. No, no. The pastor's job is to feed the flock. So the flock can bring it out to the people that need the food. That need the food. So unity. And boy, do we need it today. This unity was not produced by effort by the central focus of the church on Jesus. Sorry, I'll say that again. This unity was not produced by effort, but by the central focus of the church on Jesus. We read in Acts 5.42 that they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. He was at the heart of their lives and message. And because of that, they were uni a united church. Is Jesus at the heart and minds of what we do daily? What's the first thing in the morning that we do? And I would hope we could all say, man, I pray. God, thank you for this morning. And God, I gave myself into your hands so you will be glorified through this body, this day. If we could do that, I think lives would change. Lord, if somebody offends me this day, give me the spirit to forgive them immediately. 
and love them. God loves unconditionally. And I thank God for that. If, I, if it wasn't th for God's unconditional love, we would not be here. Amen? Because Christ died when we were yet sinners. He died for our sins. He paid them in full. He came to this earth seeing a whole world living in sin. Christ, when he died, he knew exactly every sin I commit when I hadn't even been born yet. And he paid for them back then already. And he also paid for yours. Amen? That's the kind of Savior we serve. He saw everybody was just blaspheming God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Everybody was living against God's will, and he knew nobody was going to be able to go to heaven. So he came, was born of a virgin, lived amongst sinners for 33 years, preached the gospel, died for our sins, paid our sins in hell for us. Are we thankful today? Because he knew we wouldn't be able to go to heaven if he didn't. Yes, there was unity in this church. But I also want to look at something else in verse 33. Now, I don't know how much time I have, so I'm going to... Verse 33 says, chapter 4, And with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. You know, the second characteristic, first one was unity. Second characteristic of the church was power. Fullness of the spirit will banish, will erase the powerlessness that marks so many churches today. Let me say that again. Fullness of the Spirit will banish the powerlessness that marks so many churches today. There's so little power in so many churches. But if the church is full of the Holy Spirit, this powerlessness will be erased. There will be power in the church once more. And we see that in this church. They were full of the Spirit. That's why there was, they were able to preach with power. And the power was not their own. The power was the power of God. And that's what we need to understand. Uh, I hear so many believers say, yes, I'm not good at speaking to somebody else. Yes, I don't know what to say if I should go knock on doors. And I don't, I don't know how to uh, testify to anybody. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't either. I just don't know how to do it. I don't. I have no idea how to prepare a message or how to preach. If I don't depend upon God, I just plain and simply wouldn't do it. Are we here today? It's his power we are supposed to allow to flow through us. That's all God asks. That we just give ourselves so his power can flow right through us. And when we allow that to happen, great things will happen. And especially if we allow it as a church. A church needs to be spiritually healthy for that to happen. First of all, like we already said, if we are right with God as a church and we ask God to fill the church with his Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, we'd be surprised what God can do. We'd be surprised what God could do in this church. There's nothing God cannot do. Well, I used to say that all the time. There's nothing God cannot do. Well, a preacher said, brother, I have to disagree with you on that. 
You say, you mean there is something God can't do? Are you telling me that? Yep, that's what I'm saying. God cannot sin. You are right. God cannot sin. But besides that, God is on the throne. Nothing for him is even difficult. If you give yourself completely to him, God will show his power through you. It doesn't matter who you are, what kind of education you have. If you have education or if you don't have education, God can use you in a mighty way. And God just wants us to know this so he can work through the church. So we know each and every member is important. How many members of your body is important? Are there some members in your body that are not important? Even the smallest member of our body is important. Or kidneys, if they fail, what happens? The whole body suffers because of it. People can die because of it. Every little member of our body is important. Every member of the church is important. If there's one sick member, it weakens the whole body. So we need to be right with the Lord. We need to tell the Lord, if we aren't walking right with him, Lord, this day, I come to you and I ask that you would give me the strength to walk with you from here on in. And Lord, give me a spirit to forgive all those that have done me wrong. And yes, give me the spirit to ask for forgiveness whom I've done wrong. Ouch. We don't want that, do we? No, that God would show us where we're wrong as well. This is about God. It's not about us. It's God's church. Amen? It's God's church. Yes? Does Open Bible Baptists want the powerlessness that might be here be banished? Does it want it to be erased? and start doing things together as a church. And you will see God's power change everything. Rather than listening, listening passively and going away unchanged, the people that heard the preaching repented And that first church. They repented or they got mad. You remember Stephen? How many here remember Stephen? You heard the story about Stephen in the Bible? What happened to Stephen? He was stoned to death. His preaching was so powerful that people closed their ears because they did not want to hear it, and they got mad. But others got saved. So yes, if we preach the truth, Sometimes people will get mad at us. What did Stephen do? Say, okay, man, they're getting mad. I'm, 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 I'm out of here. I'm not going to. It doesn't make a difference. It's not about us. If people reject the message, they're not rejecting you or me. They're rejecting Christ. Amen? Amen. They're not rejecting us. Let's not be selfish. Sorry, I'm so blunt, but let's not be selfish. No, I'm not sorry. I think we need to hear it. Let's not think about self. Those people that reject when we speak, what will happen to them if, we, if they don't repent? They will go to eternity. And they will suffer eternally. How long is eternity? You know, when I think about that, when I think about my dad that passed away now almost seven years ago, 
and the day I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. You know, for my dad, it's going to be like he just got there, and for me, it's been a, quite a while. In heaven, there's no time. Amen? It's eternity. God has no beginning, has no end. For God, time doesn't exist. Time is made for us. Eternity, one billion years, 10 billion years, it will still be the same amount of time in heaven and in hell as well. There's no time limit there. So I tell my mom, when you get home to be with dad, for you it's been long now already, seven years, but dad is going to say, wow, you're here. Friends, with God one day is a thousand years and a thousand years one day. Amen? There is no time limit. So let's show the power. And I'm going to look at the last thing here fast, and I'm going to go through this fast. Verse 31 says there, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Nothing could keep them from sharing the gospel. Is anything keeping us from sharing the gospel? What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel is Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. To preach the gospel, nothing could keep them from preaching the gospel. Is everybody here today preaching the gospel? That's the pastor's job, right? <laughs> no, it's not. It's everybody's job if we're saved. We cannot depend upon those people that don't know Christ to preach the gospel because they just don't know how. And this power that we're talking about, this boldness we're talking about, this unity we're talking about, can only be amongst born-again believers. So the gospel should be preached of every born-again believer. Are you a born-again believer today? So we should have this boldness that these people had. Nothing could keep them from sharing the gospel. Tre threats, intimidation, persecution, martyrdom did not deter, deter them. It didn't matter what happened in their lives. They would still preach the gospel. They would still tell the people about Jesus. It didn't matter if they were incarcerated. It didn't matter if they were told that they uh, stoned them to death. It didn't matter what the people did. They still kept on going. I believe that's what unconditional love does. If God's love, if we allow God's love to flow through us, we can't help but tell people about God. We can't help. If we are quiet, then God's love is not flowing through us the way it should. And here I'm talking to each and every born again believer. God wants us to be active. He commands us to be active in the ministry. It's a command. He's not asking. If we're not doing it, we're being disobedient to our Lord and Savior. Friends, brothers and sisters, this life is way too short not to tell people about Christ. 
Christ might come back today. And if he does, you know something? We will be in a better place. We will be changed in the blink of an eye. Wow, imagine that. When the rapture happens, we will be changed in the blink of an eye if we're still here. Amen? And if we're not, we will be raised from our graves before those that are still here are changed in the blink of an eye. You know, the Word of God is such a blessing just to read it. I ask Open Bible Baptist Church today to fall in love with the Word of God once more. To fall in love with the Word of God once more. In complete love, so you cannot separate from it at any time during the day. Like when you first got married, or you first got to know your girlfriend. You wanted to see her every day. Like when we first got saved. Tell God, Lord, help me to fall in love with your word once more. So I can show those people out there the unconditional love you have towards them. It doesn't matter what they do to us. We are still supposed to love them. We are not supposed to love sin or the sin they commit against us, but we are supposed to love who these people are. Their eternity depends upon it. Let's learn from the first church in Jerusalem. Let's be a church that's filled with the power of God. Amen? I thank you for your time. May God bless you. I think Brother Neil said that he was going to come up and preach for a little bit. Oh, no, he said somebody was going to come up and pray after, I think, or lead us in song after, uh, after uh, I was done preaching. But uh, just before we go, I just want to pray. And you know, and I don't know if you do this here in this church right now, but I do want to give an opportunity. If somebody wants to come up to the altar and just speak to God, I think it's a good thing. You know, we should never be ashamed to come up to the altar and speak to our Creator, our Savior. And I know as a church, lots of times people don't want to do that. But just come up and tell God, God, I want to live for you. Give me the strength that I need to do this. Maybe somebody wants to come up, but I will ask uh, those of us that are able to stand, please stand, and I will pray. And if somebody wants to come up here and just speak to God, uh, I, I would encourage you to do that. I think we need that sometimes. But I also want to say, if there's somebody here today that doesn't know for sure if you died today that you'd go to heaven, I want you to know how to be saved. I do. And I, I'm hoping everybody here knows they're saved. But if you don't, God wants you to know how to be saved. He sent his son to die in your place on the cross. But he needs us as sinners to acknowledge first to him. And I just will say it the way I did it when I accepted Christ. I told God, I understand that you sent your son to die for me. I don't understand how you could have such love for a sinner like me. I don't deserve it. But Lord, I believe you did it. I repent of my sins. I accept Jesus as the only one that can save me from the power of sin and eternal hell. I accept him as my personal savior. If you would do that today, if you would just acknowledge you are a sinner and without Christ, there is no hope, but with Christ, God will give you eternal life. I will ask that everybody here would close their eyes and let's pray. And if somebody wants to come up to the front and just talk to God, 
you're welcome to do that as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful